there's a little animal called a sea squirt. It's not very big, and its most complex organs are its brain and its digestive system. After it's born, it moves around to the ocean and finds a spot that it likes, where it feels the food will be good. And then it stays there for the rest of its life. And one of the first things it does after it's found its spot is to digest its brain. So it's just left with a digestive system, basically to show who's in charge. And this is not just for sea squirts. They've shown that with a, the brain, when it makes its map of reality, a lot of the information, in fact the prior information, comes in from the digestive tract. All the signals about what you're hungry for, what you lack. And that's what drives you as you look into the world outside. Your map of reality has a large portion of it devoted to what's inside, in your gut, in your stomach. Then you go out looking. This fits in with the Buddhist teachings on the fact that what defines us as beings is our need to subsist on food. We're constantly looking for the next meal. And it's good to keep this point in mind. It's often forgotten. I've been reading some books on the Eightfold Path, and the general message they give is that we suffer because we have the wrong map of reality. Inside we believe there's a permanent self, and outside there we believe there's happiness that will be permanent. And because of that wrong map, we make a lot of wrong decisions. We react to the world in the wrong way. And so the solution they propose is that you see on the one end there is no self or no permanent self inside, and outside there's nothing permanent. And so you see there's nothing worth going after, so you just give up. And that's supposed to be wisdom. You would basically take an equanimous attitude toward things as they arise and pass away, knowing ultimately everything is going to pass away and that's it. Well, to give up feeding on the world out there simply because there's no permanent self or because nothing out there is permanent is like saying you're going to stop feeding on food because you realize that your stomach is impermanent and food is impermanent. Our hunger drives us. As the Buddha said, that's our primary disease. And if we can't get the food we want, well, we'll settle for some, something else. You see this with the coyotes. You look into their scat, sometimes you find plastic rope. They couldn't get the food they wanted, but they found something to stuff in their stomachs. And as long as our hunger is driving us, we're going to keep looking for food. So the solution doesn't lie simply in changing your map of the world outside, or the world inside, to see that there's no permanent entity either inside or out. Because that, of course, doesn't take into account the fact that your inside map is not telling you about permanent entities. We don't hunger for food because we think we have a permanent self. We hunger for food because we're hungry. There's a pain. And that's what we've got to train. We've got to train our hunger. as we decide what's worth going after. And we train this through virtue, concentration, discernment. As when you're trying to wean yourself off of sugar, it takes a little while to get used to not being, not constantly getting the hit of sugar. But once you've gotten away from it for a while, then you begin to realize that if you go back to eating sugar, it doesn't feel right anymore. It smells funny, tastes funny doesn't feel right inside you. In other words, you have to learn how to abstain for a while, and you abstain largely out of confidence that this is going to be good for you. It's the same with the precepts. We abstain from behavior that we might have felt like doing. If we find pests in the house, we think it's convenient, well, we just kill them, or the little white lies. That kind of thing. But then you realize okay, you've got to abstain from these things 100%. And 
and there may be difficulties, but after a while you get used to the difficulties and you actually find that you feel better. There's a greater sense of satisfaction that comes from holding to the precepts. And then when you see people engaging in little white lies, it really hits you hard, like the smell of sugar if you've been away from sugar for a while. You realize how unhealthy it is. And same with all the other little things that would go against the precepts. If you're able to abstain from them, you train your hunger in new directions. Rather than feeding off the advantage of breaking the precepts, you feed off the sense of self-esteem, the sense of well-being, the sense of harmlessness that comes from following the precepts. Even more so with concentration, you're training your hunger. You're finding that there is a sense of well-being that can come simply by sitting here focusing on the breath, allowing the breath to get comfortable, allowing that sense of ease and well-being to spread through the body. Then as you get more skilled at it, you find that you can tap into this whenever you need it. Then you can start looking at the food that you got, say, from sensual desire or ill will. We even feed off restlessness and anxiety and uncertainty. We feed off sleepiness. All the hindrances are a kind of food, but they're bad food. And what you see is you've got a better source of food, a greater sense of well-being. You get more picky about your search for pleasure, your search for happiness, the things you want to feed off of. Remember the Buddha said that we suffer in clinging, and the clinging is another word for taking sustenance, is another word for feeding. As for discernment, the Buddha says there are five things you want to know and if you want to discern the escape from this feeding cycle. Because even though there may be some satisfaction in getting certain hungers satisfied, a lot of them you realize that the effort that goes into it and the cost that comes is, is not worth it. And that's what discernment is all about, is learning how to let go. After you've fed the mind well on concentration, you begin to look at all the other things that would pull you out of concentration. And you see that there's greed or aversion or delusion involved in going after those things. And so you want to see when the greed comes or when the anger comes, how does it come? What's its origination? What's, what's causing it? And then when it goes away, how does it go away? And you don't just stop there, though, just watching it coming and going away. Once you see the cause, you have to ask yourself, why do you go for that? What's the allure? What's the flavor? What's the sense of being fed that you get off of that? And then you compare that with the drawbacks. If you feed all of this, what are the long-term consequences? It's a lot easier to see this, in all fairness, when you've fed the mind with concentration. Because otherwise it's going to go for whatever hit it can find. But we can, you can see that the allure is very little compared to the drawbacks. That's when you can drop it. You develop dispassion for it. And in addition to dispassion, there's the word disenchantment, nibida, which also means that sense you get when you've had enough of a certain food and you don't want it anymore. That combination of disenchantment and dispassion, that's the escape. That we're not escaping just to equanimity. It's when you really escape from all the ways that you fed, the mind opens to another dimension where there is no hunger, where this happiness, a sense of well-being is something that does not require that you feed. So you don't overcome your hunger for things simply by denying it. You find something better to feed on, but you train the hunger to appreciate that. Because without the training in virtue, concentration, and discernment, the mind won't appreciate it at all. It's got to see the drawbacks of its old ways of feeding. 
than to realize that there's something better. So the way to let go is not to just deny your hunger, it's to train your hunger, to make it more discerning. To ask yourself deep down inside, what do you really want out of life? What would really be satisfying? And notice how the answer to that question is going to change as you develop more virtue, concentration, and discernment. As your hunger gets trained to the point where it's no longer needed. So instead of digesting your brain, your intelligence takes over and puts an end to the need for an avid digestive system. You find a happiness that's totally free from hunger, free from the need to feed. And that's when you let everything go. Not out of defeat, out of victory. That giving up on consuming the world because you say, well, it's not permanent and I'm not permanent, so I just might as well give up looking for happiness. It's basically saying that there is no true happiness to be found in fabricated things or even through fabricated things. So you just give up on the whole process and be equanimous. That's defeat. As the Buddha said, though, one of the names for the Eightfold Path is unexcelled victory in battle. You battle the ignorance that's been guiding your hunger. Then you come up with something much better. You've learned that you can use the processes of fabrication to create a path that would lead you to something unfabricated. And that's genuine victory. We struggle in the world because of our hunger. But when we find something that doesn't require feeding and totally satisfies our hunger, then there's no more need to struggle. As the Buddha said, better a victory over yourself than a victory over thousands of other people. And this is how the victory is won.